Good morning. I'll add my welcome to James's and Josh's. It's great to be with you this morning. My name's Dave, one of the pastors here at Gold Hill. And whether you're in person or joining online, it is fantastic to be with you this morning. I have a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? No, I've not got confused. I don't think I'm doing the all age slot. I'm not addressing just the children. What do you want to be when you grow up? Some of you are thinking, well, Dave, I don't have much growing up left to do. Some of you are looking at the person next to you and thinking, yes, they do. <laughs> it's a question that we so readily ask of children because we think they've got their whole lives ahead of them. They've got so much possibility, so many things, so many directions things could go. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do with your life? I don't know quite what age it is we stop asking that question, but at some point we do. At some, at some point we stop thinking, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? We assume that the course we're on is just going to meet its natural conclusion. It's just going to keep going the way things are. Or maybe we just think there's no new experiences left. There's nothing new that we might be able to do with our life. This morning, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? But not just what do you want to do with the rest of your life. How about this for a different question? What does God want you to be when you grow up in your future? What does God want you to be tomorrow? Where does God want to take you tomorrow? What does God want you to be today? We're carrying on our series uh, looking through the Lord's Prayer, examining it verse by phrase and idea by idea. And we spent the, the, the August pretty much looking at this phrase, your kingdom come. We've been looking at what the kingdom of God is like been thinking about it, the fact that it's eternal. It's, it's far bigger than anything else we could ever uh, imagine. It's, it's something that's, that's exciting, that we can invite people to be part of. Maria was inviting people to be part of that kingdom last week. We've thought about the fact that even though we are citizens of the kingdom of God, it can be so difficult to, to live fully like that because there are other things that are trying to pull us away. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, is where we've got to. Your will be done. Not just God's kingdom coming in the world around us, but his will being done in the world and in our own lives. That's what we're thinking about this morning. And I want to ask you, what are the decisions you are needing to make? What are the things you're not sure about for your future? Where are the decision points or the, or the difficulties or the confusions where well, you really need to know what God's will is? It's very easy to pray your will be done, or at least it's very easy to say it. Is it far more difficult, though, to, to mean it, to say whatever the cost, your will be done? And, and when we say your will be done, do we even know what that will is? So this morning, hi, yeah, have a, good, have a good week. Hopefully see you next week again. Very well, thank you very much. I will happily pray for you. You keep going and I will pray for you right now. Is that all right? Fantastic. Father God, I want to pray for Michael. Thank you that he's part of our family. Thank you that he's with us now. And I pray that where he's going and over the next week, you would be close to him and you would be with him. Would you bless him? Amen. Thank you very much. See you, see you again. <laughs> So we're going to be thinking this morning, not just in airy, fairy, general terms about what God's will is, but where does this hit the road for you? What is God's will for your life tomorrow? So how are we going to do that? Well, for those of you taking notes, I'm trying to be structured this morning. So I want to look at five guides we can use in discerning God's will. I want to look at three givens, three rules, three essentials. And I'm going to leave you with one question. Five guides, three rules, and one question. But before that, the problem, the problem that we all face, the reason why discerning God's will is difficult in the first place. Because the reality is that if God's will was always the same as my will, if what God wanted for my life was always the same as what I wanted for my life, the whole thing would be very easy. Because I could just wake up in the morning and go, what do I want to do today? Or I could think, what do I want to do with the next year of my life? Where do I want to live? Who do I want to be with? What impact do I want to make? 
And then I'll just try and do those things. The reality is, though, God is not me and I am not God. Discerning his will is not just about deciding what will make me happy. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, we read this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And there lies the dilemma. My thoughts are not God's thoughts. My ways are not God's ways. This poses a problem when we're trying to work out what it is he wants of our community, what he wants of my life. Then he, he, he explains that he's so much higher, as high as the heavens, the skies, space is above the earth. That's how much higher God's ways are than ours, how much higher his thoughts are than ours. He has a, he has a higher perspective. He sees things from the perspective of, of omnipotence, of all-powerfulness, of omniscience, all-knowingness, being able to see into history and into the future, seeing everything, seeing how all the pieces hang together. He can see all of that. His perspective is so much higher than my perspective here in my own life, only able to see things from my own shoes, only able to see things through my own experiences, my own eyes. That's how much higher his ways of thinking are than mine. But he also has the perfect motivation. His, his, his desires for the world are based on righteousness and goodness and purity and being perfect. Whereas mine, maybe sometimes based on some of those things a little bit, but there's sin in my life and there's selfishness in my life. And so when I think about what I should do with my life, inevitably what I'm thinking about partly is what's going to make me happiest? What do I want? What will be easiest for me? That's not the only way that God thinks about things. His ways are higher. His ways are purer. Which means that if we only ever trust our own judgment, our own desires, our own thoughts about our lives, we're going to come unstuck. So how is it that we can hope to discern what God's will might be? In the New Testament, when Paul was writing to the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, some of my favorite parts of the Bible say this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to, the wor to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." Paul lays out for us something of the groundwork so that, so that even though God's ways are so much higher than ours, we might be able to discern what is the will of God. And there are, there are two things he encourages us to do. One is to present ourselves, present our whole lives to God as living sacrifices. Part of this dilemma starts to get unstitched when we say, I'm giving myself to you. I'm relinquishing control of myself to you. I'm giving myself to you as a living sacrifice. This is no longer about me and my desires. This is about me belonging to you, God. A living sacrifice. What does that mean? Most sacrifices die. They're put on the altar. They're killed. That's what a sacrifice is. We are to be given to God, but not to die. We are to be given to God so that we can live. We, we give him our, our normal, everyday life and say, this is yours now. When we've chosen to relinquish control of our life to God, at that point, discerning his will can start to become possible because it's no longer going to be about my selfish desires. It's going to be about what God wants. The second thing that Paul encourages us to do is not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind. This is about being given new ways and new thoughts. Why? Because our thoughts and our ways are not God's. This is a rejection of just fitting in with the world, of conforming with the world. And very clearly, Paul says that our transformation of our lives so that we can discern what God wants from us and with us and for us starts with the renewing of our minds, of seeing things differently, of thinking about things differently. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. 
Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. When we are in Christ, when we are, when we are born of him, there is something new that comes and it impacts the way we see the world. That phrase, see, everything has become new, can also be understood, can also be translated as see everything newly. See everything in a new way. What God wants for our lives is that our thinking, our way of seeing the world, our way of understanding the world be so radically changed so that it becomes in line with his. And then we will start to be able to understand what his will is. That's the goal. That our ways become closer to his ways. That our thoughts become closer to his thoughts because he is renewing and transforming us. How do we get there? When it comes to those everyday decisions, when it comes to what is it God wants of my life, how can we be step by step getting closer to being those people whose minds have been and are being transformed? Well, this is where we come to those five guides, five guides, five, five things that we can look to to guide our decision making, to help us as we seek to discern what, what God will, God's will is specifically for us. Now, I must confess, as I was preparing this, I thought, actually, I can't think of a better way of expressing this than the way someone else has. Nikki Gumbel, in the outline for the talk for one of the, uh, one of the Alpha course series, um, the, 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 the talk on how does God guide me, he uses five CSs as, as, as ways in which God guides us. Now, inevitably, when any speaker or preacher tries to condense things down to things that all start with the same two letters, there's going to be an element of it being tenuous. So you'll have to go with me on this. But they, they encompass, I think, a lot of the ways that God wants to guide us. Each of them is essential and is very useful. None of them is perfect. None of them, none of them are complete. They all have drawbacks when we approach them. So what are these five guides, these five guides we can use in discerning God's will? The first CS is this commanding scripture. Scripture provides some very clear statements about life. And the first thing that we need to remember is that when we are seeking to discern God's will for our life, it will never be contradictory to what scripture says. It will never take us in a direction that scripture would not. Scripture speaks very clearly about giving and generosity. That, that the wealth and the money and the things that we have are not ours to be held on to. They are God's to be used. They are to be used for his purposes and his will. That means we don't, have to, we don't have to spend time in our life thinking, is it God's will in my life for me to be generous? Should I be a stingy person or a generous person? That's not a question we need to ask. We know what God's will, is, uh, will in our life is for that. Of course, how we apply that, how we give our money, the way that we use our property and our possessions, that is something that we need to discern. But whether or not we see it as ours or God's is not. Think about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments give very clear instructions about how to live life and how not to live life. We don't need to spend a lot of time thinking, should I be someone who steals or shouldn't I be someone who steals? There are very clear lines. Of course, that's not always how the Bible works. We can't say, okay, I've got to get up. Oh, no, I'm thinking, should I take this job or should I not take this job? Should I go on this trip or should I not go on this trip? Should we think about buying a house? Should we think about downsizing? Should I, when should I take retirement? We can't turn to the passage of the Bible that gives us the answer to those questions. There are biblical principles involved that have to do with generosity and the way that we might serve God, and the way that we would prioritize different things in our lives. But we have to work out how to apply them. The deeper work of scripture is not about, we've read this verse, so then we go and do this thing. It's not a sort of instruction manual for life. The deeper work of scripture is that it is forming the mind of Christ within us. As we throw ourselves into this story that God is telling, this great narrative, this great this great ballad of everything that God has been doing in the world, as we throw ourselves into it, as we immerse ourselves into it, we know more and more and more what God is like. We understand more and more what his ways and his thoughts might be. 
so that we can then have that shaped within us. If we approach the Bible as a quick fix guide, we'll put it down very, very quickly. If we pick it up daily, exploring it, diving into it, grappling with it, bit by bit, God will be forming his mind within us. And then we will be able to discern what his will is because our thinking will be much closer to his. So that's the first CS, commanding scripture. Then we have a compelling spirit, the compelling spirit. Because here's the truth, the God whose thoughts are not your thoughts and whose ways are not your ways has chosen to live within you if you are a Christian. He dwells within you and he is there to guide you. John chapter 16 Uh, Verse 13 says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. need to be careful here because primarily this is talking about the apostles. This is talking about those who had followed Jesus and the spirit coming on them and reminding them of everything he had taught them. So that they could write it down, so they could teach it, so they could share it. But that same spirit who can inspire an understanding in them can inspire that in us. That same spirit who led them on as they planted and formed and grew the early church leads us on as well. With prompts and nudges and senses of things, with a, with a sense of our own conscience working within us, with a sense of, of, of not being able to ignore something, with something niggling away at us. Let's be careful not to ignore those things. If there's something that that, that you can't seem to stop thinking about or or, or having a passion for, if there's something that, that is constantly niggling at you, God might be wanting to speak to you about that thing. I remember the first time I heard someone talking about about the fact that God had spoken to them in a prophetic dream. And they spoke about it and they explained this dream. And I thought to myself, that just sounds like a dream. How did you know that this was different from another dream that you'd had? And I didn't really know the answer to that question until I had a dream that I knew was God speaking to me. And I wouldn't necessarily be able to explain to you how I knew that either. But there was a deep sense when I woke up that this was something that God was wanting to speak through me to someone else. A deep sense of not being able to just ignore it and let it go. Not very often, but a few times from this pulpit, as I've got up to speak, I've felt very strongly that God is saying to abandon what I was going to be speaking on and to say something different instead. What does that mean? How does that feel? Well, I'm sure it feels different for me than it would for someone else. But, but for me, there's a, there's a quickening of my heart. There's a tensing of my muscles. There's God using physical things to get, get my attention. This is the spirit compelling something within me because he wants me to do something. Part of our duty as Christians is to, is to work out how we can become more responsive to what God is saying. The spirit is trying to speak to us. The spirit is trying to prompt us. It doesn't mean we can just switch off our own brains and never think about things. But the spirit is trying to work within us. How good are we at listening? How good are we at being attuned to those promptings of the spirit? The drawback here is that it can just make us lazy. We can say, well, I'm never going to do anything unless I've heard the spirit tell me. In John chapter 15, verse 15, just a few verses before what I just read, Jesus says to the disciples, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I've made known to you everything I've heard from my father. A slave or a servant sits there and waits until they're given instructions and then they go and do it. A friend, a co-worker, a companion is someone who is brought into the fold, is brought into understanding what the purpose is, what the plan is. And is then released to go and get involved in doing it. Don't be someone who waits and waits and waits and waits and waits. And waits and waits until you're sure you know that God has spoken. Thus saith the Lord. That's not always how God speaks to us. I remember once, uh, way before I came to Gold Hill, 
I was trying to lead a children's group, and there was quite a tight turnaround between two different parts of the day. It was a one-day event, and I thought, I really could do with some help, because the leaders I've got are sufficient to help out with the kids, but I really could just do with a few more pairs of hands, just for 15 minutes, to turn around the room and to get everything sorted. So I sent a message to a few people, and I called a few people, and I said, is there any chance you, you could just come and spend those 15 minutes? I, it would make a big difference, be a great way of serving. I'd be really appreciative. And most people just said, yeah, sure, that's fine. I had a message back from one person saying, let me pray and, and, and ask whether the Lord is asking me to do this. And I thought, it's 15 minutes. Couldn't you make that decision by yourself? Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't pray and discern about things. There are different levels of decision in our lives. Of course there are. We need to be discerning about when we can just say, yeah, because it's a good thing to do. And when we need to take more time and care and effort over that decision. So that's the second guide. The third, Nicky Gumbel describes as the council of the saints. You could just refer, re refer to that as asking other Christians for advice. Talking to people who you know are wise, who can guide you, who can spur you on, who you know will not necessarily just say what you want to hear, but who will be able to say, actually, I think this might be a direction that God is leading you in. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, we read this. In verse 24, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's consider how to provoke one another to good deeds. We can't do this by ourselves. The same spirit that has been given to me has been given to you. Sometimes my own selfishness, my own confusion, my own perspective can cloud out what he's trying to say to me. And I need your guidance. Who is it in your life who you go to? Who's your person or your people who have the right to speak into your life, who have the right to say, you need to think about this. God might be leading you in this direction. Who is it you can go to and say, help me figure this one out? Council of the saints. Of course, people can be wrong. And no one else is accountable before God for the decisions you make. I don't think when it comes to that day and I'm stood before God and, and he says, well, why did you do this? I can't turn around and say, well, so-and-so told me to. I am accountable for my decisions, but I sometimes need you to help me make them. Fourth CS, common sense. I think it's the CS that makes most sense, actually, but common sense. You've been given a brain, so use it. Human factors in your life come into play. When you're making decisions about your life, God does care about your children's schooling and not wrenching them out of places. God does care about the financial viability of what he might be asking you to do. God does care about your safety. God does care about the, the, the things that he's planted into you through your own education, your own experiences. If God has given you the head of an engineer or the, or the heart of an engineer or of an artist or of a teacher, there's a, there's a strong chance he might be asking you to use those things. Using our common sense, looking at our life and saying, actually, what makes sense? What makes the most of what God has given me? The drawback here is that every so often, God doesn't care about common sense. And God asks us to do something that is so radically out, makes no sense from our perspective. God has a history of calling people to do things that make no sense. Think of Noah. Think of Moses. Think of Abraham. Think of pretty much any character in the Bible. And you see them being asked to do things that make no sense. Doesn't mean we should abandon our sense. Just means that we shouldn't always put too much stock in it. And finally, number five, what could have just been called seeing things going on around us, circumstantial signs. God is not just at work in your life. He's at work in the world. If there are situations that all seem to be pointing in one direction, maybe that's what God wants you to look at. There were 14 people in my life who told me that they thought I should go into church ministry before I finally started to listen. I remember when I was leaving university and I was trying to work out what I should do, where I should go. There was a, youth, a trainee youth worker at my church. I was very involved in the youth work at the time. There was a trainee youth worker who, who left, who was leaving, and she came, she came and said to me, Dave, I really think you should think about applying for my job. And I thought, oh, that's exciting. 
Then the senior youth worker came to me and said, Dave, I don't know if you've heard, but she's leaving. Would you think about applying for her job? And I thought, hmm, that's quite cool. And then one of the associate ministers in the church came to me and said, I don't know if you've heard, but she's leaving. Would you think about applying for her job? And I thought, mm, OK, this seems to be leading somewhere. And then the senior leader of the church came to me and said, I don't know if anyone's spoken to you, but would you consider applying for her job? And so I applied for her job. And I didn't get the job. <laughs> and it was really tough. Because I'd taken all of those signs as, this is the will of the Lord. And I remember before going to the interview, I prayed and I said, Lord, you know that I really want this job and I think it's the right thing, but your will be done. I thought, it's, it's a, it's a shoe-in. It's great. The drawback to relying too much on the signs that we think we can interpret is that sometimes we'll get them wrong. Sometimes life doesn't go as it seems like it should. And those unmet expectations can be devastating. If we start to say everything seems to be going a certain way, therefore it is the will of the Lord, and it turns out not to be, we can end up heartbroken. It can be very hard to get back on the horse and to trust him again for the future. We should look out for those things. We should try and see where things are pointing, but we should never trust too strongly our own sense that we've got it nailed and we've got it figured out. So commanding scripture, what is the Bible saying about our situations? A compelling spirit, what nudges or prompts or, or senses are we, are, we, are we getting? The counsel of the saints, what are other people speaking into our life? Common sense, what does our own brain tell us? And circumstantial signs, where are things pointing to around us? Those are the five guides. Very quickly, three rules. This bit's far quicker. When someone came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all, on, on, all, on those two things, all of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, hang. Love God, love others as you love yourself. God's will for your life is never anything other than loving him, loving others, in the same way that you love yourself. Loving him, deepening that relationship with him, knowing him better, creating time with him. These are things that as a preacher, I can say this is God's will for your life. Scripture has told us. I can't tell you the ins and outs of everything you should be doing with your day to day, but I can tell you that you should be loving God more deeply as your life goes on, becoming more willing to say yes to him becoming more ready to trust him, loving him more deeply, obeying him more fully. Where in your relationship with God does his will to love him more need to be more apparent? What about loving others, serving one another, being available to one another, praying for one another, having a deep sense of compassion and empathy for one another? Showing God's love to the world around us. Loving the world around us as we love ourselves. Telling people the good news of who Jesus is. Where does that need some work in your life? What might God's will be for you in relation to other people in this next season? And finally, loving others as you love yourself. Friends, you're never going to be able to love others fully and completely unless you love yourself. Not in a puffing yourself up kind of way, not in a self-righteous or self-indulgent kind of way, but the reality is you matter. It is right, it is God's will that you would invest in yourself, in your physical needs. Where do you need to look after yourself a bit better? Do you need to be getting a bit more rest? Do you need to be taking a bit more time out? Do you need to get up and go for a run every so often? Do you need to eat a little bit more healthily? Where do you need to invest in yourself? What about your emotional needs? Are there things that you need to find a way to work through so that you can let go, so that you can move on into your future with God by your side? Where is it that you can be aiming to equip yourself, asking people to invest in you, to give you the skills, to give you the understanding? Where can you be training yourself? 
If Jesus says that the two greatest commands are that we love God and we love each other as we love one another as we love ourselves, then surely those are a good place to start start from. Three rules for discerning God's will, because there's nothing that He's ever going to ask you to do that falls outside those those three things. So I said five guides, three rules, and a question. The question simply is this. When was the last time you stopped to ask, what's God's will for my life? What do I want to be today, tomorrow, as I continue to grow up? And if the answer is, actually, it was a while ago, and I've just sort of been on autopilot, then can I encourage you, gently, but maybe firmly, to take that time? Ask some people to journey with you on that, perhaps. But to ask, what is it God is asking of me? You might be entering a new season of your life anyway. It's a perfect time to do that. You may not be. It's always the right thing to be asking, what is God's will for my life? I'm going to invite Josh and the guys to come back and lead us in one final song. But I would like to pray for us as individuals and as a church family. Father God, thank you. That while you could choose to do everything you want to in the world without us, you want to be working with us and through us. Thank you that you have a purpose for each of us. Thank you that you want to reveal that purpose to us. So I pray that for each individual here or joining us online, you would be showing us clearly what the next steps are for our lives. You would be showing us where we need to invest more in our relationship with you, in others, in ourselves, that we may become more and more renewed and transformed by you and able to discern your will. And for us as a church family, Lord, I pray, would you continue to drive us forward? Thank you that you have spoken to us through your word, by your spirit, through individuals, through things happening around us. Thank you that you have never left this church alone and that you won't start now. And I pray that you would give us a greater sense of your calling, a greater clarity of your vision. Thank you that no matter how far we get in this journey, there will always be more of you, more of your ways, more of your thoughts, more of who you are for us to and lead us on, I pray. Amen. Amen.